Jai Basan. Jai Basan. Welcome to Darwin. Darwin helps multinational companies get more value from their benefits spent by increasing engagement, automating administration, managing cost, and reducing risk. Here are just a few examples of how it does this. Benefit enrollment is one of the first points of contact a new starter has with your business and your employee value proposition. Darwin's consumer grade employee experience matches your employees' high expectations of your business. As a single global platform, Darwin gives your people a consistently excellent experience, no matter where in the world they are. Darwin sits at the center of your HCM ecosystem. The automated data feeds between Darwin and your HR, payroll, and provider systems, meaning that data is always current. Your employees can access their benefits from day one, and selections are with providers immediately. Darwin helps you be there for your people at the moments that matter. Using the feed from your HCM, Darwin recognizes when your employees hit major milestones and sends automated communications congratulating them and suggesting relevant benefits. Benefit teams are under increasing pressure to do more with less. By automating your repeatable, low-value ad tasks, Darwin frees your team up to do the strategic and transformational work you never seem to have time for. Human handling of data introduces the risk of data errors, or worse, breaches. Darwin automates your processes and transfers, eliminating the risk of human error and giving you oversight of processes and audit tracking for strong governance. To find out more, please get in touch to request a tailored demonstration. Welcome to Darwin. Darwin helps multinational companies get more value from their benefits spent by increasing engagement, automating administration, managing cost, and reducing risk. Here are just a few examples of how it does this. Benefit enrollment is one of the first points of contact a new starter has with your business and your employee value proposition. Darwin's consumer grade employee experience matches your employees' high expectations of your business. As a single global platform, Darwin gives your people a consistently excellent experience, no matter where in the world they are. Darwin sits at the center of your HCM ecosystem. The automated data feeds between Darwin and your HR, payroll, and provider systems, meaning that data is always current. Your employees can access their benefits from day one, and selections are with providers immediately. Darwin helps you be there for your people at the moments that matter. Using the feed from your HCM, Darwin recognizes when your employees hit major milestones and sends automated communications congratulating them and suggesting relevant benefits. Benefit teams are under increasing pressure to do more with less. By automating your repeatable, low-value ad tasks, Darwin frees your team up to do the strategic and transformational work you never seem to have time for. Human handling of data introduces the risk of data errors, or worse, breaches. Darwin automates your processes and transfers, eliminating the risk of human error and giving you oversight of processes and audit tracking for strong governance. To find out more, please get in touch to request a tailored demonstration. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much and welcome to the Mercer Must Benefits webinar for today. We are today here to discuss about reimagining benefits and rewards, a digital first approach. Thanks again for joining us on a Friday afternoon. Looking forward to a very interactive session today. I'm Praval Kalita. I lead the Mercer Must Benefits team in India and pleased to have all of you out here today joining us in this conversation. We have a very esteemed panel today joining us. I'll introduce our panel of experts. We have Sriram, who heads Total Rewards, 
for India and APAC. He's the director of Total Rewards for India and APAC in Qualcomm. We have Sankal Naswa, who's the head of Total Rewards for South Asia in Nestle. We have with us Basant Balachandran, who's the director for pay benefits and global mobility in Target. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us today. And it'll, it is our privilege to have all of you joining us in this discussion today. We also have our global leader for transformation and growth of Darwin business, Jamie Fit. He has joined us. And we have with us Gaurava Gupta, who's the Darwin leader for Masama's benefits in India. With this, I'd like to hand over the floor to Jamie. He will take us through a in, you know, uh, it, he'll take us through a discussion around how overall, you know, globally we are looking at Darwin and overall digital transformation uh, to transform the world of health and benefit. Jamie, over to you, please. Thank you, Prahal. Okay, let me just the screen. Cool. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. As Prahal said, my name is Jamie Fitz. I'm a SVP here at MMB and was lucky enough to be involved in the very early creation of the Darwin product 16 years ago. So somewhat of, a, of an industry veteran. And I guess whilst we're a little bit tired of the pandemic and all of the impact it's had on us, I guess having worked in the industry, it's probably been the biggest catalyst for change that we've seen in certainly the time I've worked. And it's really advanced both the well-being and the technology agenda for companies that they now need to offer to engage their employees. So I'm going to take you through very briefly some, some of the source material that we did in our latest MMB Tech Trends report uh, called Digital First Approach to Benefits. It was published in November. And it surveyed over two and a half thousand employers and employees across the world, including those in India itself. And I guess the most obvious thing to say is that we know that the world of work is demanding change. Uh, the pandemic has given us all a shift in how we how we live our lives and we live our work lives. Um, flexibility isn't nice to have anymore, but a fundamental. And all across the world, we haven't seen any of our clients mandate a five day return to an office type environment and it remains to be seen where it will come to in terms of corporate mandates versus employee choice but we believe that employee choice and flexibility will continue to be the dominant force and during the pandemic whether it was graduates who were just starting their first job or uh, new parents homeschooling their children or baby boomers who are worried about the impact of their retirement Fund with the financial effect, the biggest, most consistent challenge we saw from our clients was how do they keep their employees engaged, connected, and supported during a great time of uncertainty that we had during the pandemic. And how we reacted, uh, reacted and adapted, and how we'll be able to into the future, we feel is one of the defining trends in our industry that we'll see. But in terms of the, uh, the challenge of keeping employees connected and engaged as it went COVID-19 spread across the world, um, it, what it did mean is that benefits really increased in their relevance and shot up the corporate agenda. Even before the pandemic, we were seeing increasing involvement at the C-suite. We know that benefits are typically 15 to 20% of payroll spend. And we're beginning to see boards really realize the impact that benefits have in terms of achieving business objectives. And employers became focused not just on giving employment, but actually how can they support employees from financial, mental, physical well-being, and so on. And our research shows this. So we saw from our research that 85% of benefits and rewards teams say that their role has increased in importance as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. 88% of benefit teams that we surveyed saw increased involvement from the C-suite in the design, communication, and execution of their, COVID, uh, of their benefit strategy. And it's not unsurprisingly that due to that C-suite involvement, we saw that seven in 10 of our respondents increased benefit spend directly as a result of the pandemic and likely due to that C-suite involvement. So whilst this is all brilliant, brilliant and great for industry, what we believe is that into the future, all of the companies that have invested in benefits and, and well-being over the past 12, 18 months, there'll be an increased demand for the analytical return and the ROI that they have from their board in order to keep the funding going. So we see that as one of the next, next challenges. But it's also really a bit in terms of what, what did they spend their money on. So 84% of our uh, surveys from them introduced new wellbeing with benefits as a direct result of the pandemic. 80% of organizations saw changes in benefits employees are using, and they were able to see those changes because they had a system in place that gave them that analytical insights and they were able to pivot and drive their engagement. And it's perhaps somewhat obvious, but uh, investment in employee wellbeing increased 60% as a result of the pandemic. And whilst you may have thought that it would have been around mental wellbeing would have been the, the biggest driver, actually it's the increased financial wellbeing support that we saw was the biggest wellbeing benefit introduced uh, as a result of the pandemic. 
we see that now with inflationary pressures happening uh, around the world as we as we come back out that need for increased financial wellbeing support and the impacts it has in terms of mental health will continue to be really really relevant so the way in which that is delivered at a scalable fashion by our clients will continue to be incredibly important but overall it's it's really positive we've seen uh, a brilliant change i guess in the investment and relevance of benefits so for, for me working in the industry and passionate about it that's been brilliant for us and we know there's a proven correlation so our research told us that actually employees that were engaged with their benefit program are two times more likely to say that they'd recommend their employer uh, to a friend or a colleague uh, they have a positive experience at work they're proud to work for their company and we've seen as well that 45 percent are more likely to be advocates of their organizations a direct correlation to their, to their benefit investment and so on but it's not all great actually one in four employees uh, say their organization didn't offer benefits that uh, provided them support during the pandemic so there's certainly more that we can do in order to drive and communicate the benefits that we offer to our employees in a better more consistent fashion but we know that the importance of employee engagement has increased. It's been one of the defining factors in our, in our industry. It's hard to measure. It's hard to, to get a feel for it. But we know when employees are even more dispersed than they've ever been. Working from home, flexible working patterns are becoming the norm. And there's never been a greater need, I guess, to share a greater employee experience and, and feeling of belonging within the company. We know one size doesn't fit all of our benefit programs. As I said earlier, we've got uh, new graduates, uh, parents, baby boomers, people approaching retirees. And it's the really fundamental thing that we've seen that benefits directly correlate uh, to employee engagement with the talent that we're seeing as we rebound out of the pandemic. And I guess what we've seen is that actually it, empl employers that were able to shift and have a flexible approach had a much, much higher return in terms of their employee engagement and also the spend that they had in their, their benefits. So what we would, would challenge you today is, do you feel that you have the flexibility when it comes to your own organisation in the delivery of your benefits programme and your employee engagement strategy? Fascinatingly, that 70% of our uh, respondents who reported that they only made a slight or small shift in their benefit plan had no technology in which to deliver it. Equally, we saw that 70% of our respondents, the same number, uh, were disappointed at the impact they had when they added one benefit, but they also had no overall ecosystem and technology. They were adding benefits in isolation of a broader strategy. So it's no surprise that they weren't able uh, to realise the benefits of that. And again, like we said, so fast moving, having the technology to be able to be flexible, to adapt, to offer new benefits, to do it in a consistent global manner is really key so whilst there's been brilliant advancement in the industry that we've seen uh it's not all a rosy picture in fact in our survey we saw that three in ten of the companies we surveyed lack technology in order to deliver changes 36 percent found their systems couldn't adapt or update or change the benefit offering that they wanted to give to their employees and we did see also that budget was a challenge and it's no surprise whilst there's been increased investment in uh in benefit spend Equally, companies have had a variety of challenges to deal with. So not all of our, our companies were able to improve and increase their technology. We know that technology itself is a big enabler in delivering more efficiency uh, and a quicker way to, to deliver benefits to employees. Then fascinating me as well, uh, another proof point here is that actually, again, organizations that had no benefits technology or ecosystem approach in place, six, 60%, six in 10 of those said, their employee experience got worse as a, as, a, as a result of the pandemic. So likely, whilst there would have been a benefit scheme in place at the organisation, the employees weren't able to access it in a clear, consistent, engaging fashion, and therefore didn't feel their organisation were able to support them effectively through the pandemic. And we do have a disconnect, sadly, because we know that as in our industry as HR and, and benefit professionals, everyone tries to do their best in terms of the offering they give to, to their employees. And almost every organization we surveyed, I, I talked about this earlier, have introduced new well-being benefit, uh, new well-being benefits to their, to their staff, but actually only a third of employees say that they feel their benefits have changed in response to the pandemic. So again, we have this disconnect of companies investing and spending more on well-being benefits, but not delivering them in the best, most engaging, effective fashion. And therefore that spend that we have on benefits isn't being maximized in terms of the ROI and employees aren't feeling that they're getting that investment, which is a, a real shame uh, and something that technology certainly enables. 
then when we talk about the cost, and as I said, with all of this increased spend that we've seen, um, whilst it's been very relevant and timely within the pandemic, incredibly, just under 70% of all organisations, it would take them longer than a week to answer a very simple question, what's our highest custom benefit? So all of this investment and increased uh, spend that we've seen, yet actually the majority of organisations aren't able to report out in their analytics platform what's their, their highest costing benefit. Again, technology, analytics, the consistency of data are all clear enablers to this question. So it's no surprise we feel that technology is the enabler. Um, benefits themselves, as we say, 15, typically 15, 20% of, of a payroll spend. But actually that's only part of the investment. We know and we passionately believe that uh, the way in which they're delivered, communicated and automated through the administration is a huge enabler in making that benefit spend real. Um, we've seen an increase in technology investment. And again, we would ask you, does the experience that you offer your employees, is it consumer grade? Is it like experiences that they have on their, on their phone uh, when they book holidays or when they uh, buy insurance and so on? Is it the same capability that they have? Uh, and the most immersive experience. We saw as well that actually only 50% of employees can access and manage their, their benefits in one place through one software platform. So there's still so much more work to do that we can do. And despite the, the clear connection between robust support, increased employee wellbeing, loyalty and engagement, more needs to be done, we believe, in how uh, benefits and, and all of the engagement benefits they offer can be delivered to employees. And technology is certainly the enabler. So really what we'd say is if you can take anything away from the last, uh, last 10, 12 minutes that I've been able to speak to you is that we firmly believe that the age of adaptability is here. COVID was a huge catalyst in really testing out how flexible and adaptable organisations were. But through the increased spend and investment, we know that a lot more organisations are future-proofed and, and ready to, uh, to adapt to the next changes. Certainly we've seen, as I say, 85% making changes to the benefit offering, 80% working change in the benefits employees are using, 72% spending more, 60% increasing employee wellbeing. These are all really positive things. The C-suite has never been more involved. The package being offered are changing at pace, and we're seeing the investment following through from organisations. So we believe the age of adaptability is here, as I said, and now the, the work for our industry and for HR team is how do we continue to build out engaging, effective and impactful benefit strategies underpinned by agile tech uh, technology that deliver real value to you and organization. We'd be delighted to help you uh, in your journey to discover all of those. And I will hand now back to Gorova to take us through to the panel discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jamie. Let's talk about the Indian aspect of benefits, right? Two different aspects. What is that employees are looking for from an Indian perspective? Second, how do we actually deliver these benefits? It's not just about creating best of the benefits, but also about taking it to them, increasing the acceptability, expanding the reach of these benefits. A quick look of who our target audience is. Like in marketing, you look at who your target audience is, and then accordingly, you design your communication plans, deliveries. A quick numbers around, uh, a common Indian employee, starting young, playing supportive role to a large set of dependents, and fighting through a growing gap between salaries and expenses. World Inequality Report of 2022 states that the average Indian middle class has wealth of rupees 7 lakh 23,930 rupees. That's the lump sum saving which he carries. While the, and this is the middle class, while the bottom 50% only has average of roughly about 66,280 rupees. Compare this with the average claim cost during the COVID second wave in India, which as per the GI Council data was at roughly about 141,000, which explains the financial panic situation which COVID created. And how severe was this financial panic situation? As per the Niti Aayog report, the government agency, 
over 25,000 suicides happened in the year 2021 due to loss of jobs and debts. It's safe to say that an average Indian employee knows that regular salaries and increments can take them only this far in life, and it's not far enough. Employer-sponsored benefit programs today have become an indispensable part of an employee's life. And expectation from these benefits are not just limited to support for the healthcare expenses, but across much wider life goals. There's an overwhelming number of employees who are today seeking support across personal finances, retirement planning, career progression, and more from the employer. Now, this takes us to our first set of poll question. Which all support systems, and uh, we would want you to answer, which all support systems your organization is currently providing? We have virtual healthcare, which has all the doctor consultation, pharmacy purchase, diagnostic services. Uh, second is help in finding and coordinating medical care. That includes your IPT desk, patient management services, which you can subscribe to. Financial consultations around health expenses financing, which came up big during the COVID. Loans, investment, taxes support for psychiatric conditions, support for psychological conditions, healthy habit building applications, and career counseling services. Great, so while virtual healthcare has been at the top of it, the health condition management services is something which probably is still to pick up the pace. Now, as, as you can see, across these options, almost in all cases, there was a significant number of companies, employers who have provided that, some high, some low. The key aspect is the benefit philosophy is moving from transactional to transformational approach. Benefits which have more touch points, benefits where employers aim to establish much deeper connect with the employees at a much more regular basis, not just one-time benefits, and support them closely through their everyday issues to ensure that they can retain their focus on the jobs. Now, this calls for a continuous support across larger life goals, has actually resulted in a paradigm shift in benefit design, where an increasing number of employers are compelled to create benefit programs which can have a near daily relevance in employees' lives. Benefits like digital healthcare, which we saw, financial planning, investment planning, elder care, these are gaining more limelight than traditional one-time benefits like inpatient health expenses covers. But leading employers who are on this journey, they're investing on two parts. One, specialist teams, which design and deliver these at a continuous basis, and also technologies, which are capable of connecting with employees at such a frequent basis. Now, this calls for quickly our second poll question. We saw the uptake of benefits. Now, how, how can you access these benefits? Creating best of the benefits is good, but how are these getting delivered? So same set of benefits again, Virtual healthcare, help in finding and coordinating medical care, health condition management services, financial consulting, support for psychiatric conditions, support for psychological condition, career counseling, healthy habits. How many of these can you access from your mobile devices? And I mean out of company network. You need not route it through the company network, out of it, at the comfort of your home while you're working from home. How easily can you access them? Take the ones that you can right now. Right. So as you can see, virtual healthcare surely has picked up the number. But financial consultation, health expenses financing, we saw in the first one, the gap between the average wealth which an Indian middle class has. Obviously, the Company-sponsored programs cannot cover all health expenses. What happened for the people who ran out of money, 
who needed support? Were they able to access the company sponsored programs while these were there? But how easy was it to access from your mobile devices? And if, uh, Now, this is the key, how the benefits have evolved, how the deliveries have evolved, right? How do, you, how do you gain and maintain attention of a large and diverse employee groups? Can it be through the traditional model of creating benefit manuals, sending it to them and expect them to read? In our Indian context, our target audience is at least three generations. We started the whole industrial, uh, new industrial policy way back in 1991, 2022, exactly 30 years apart three generations of people working with us and who are coming from about 28 states, eight union territories speaking over 120 different languages. How do I get their attention? And second, this population is getting conditioned by the social media algorithms, which have made their attention span of less than eight seconds. That's the time which your benefits pitch gets to them. They would decide whether they would want to read through it or they would want to discard it. Now, older days benefit communication model was more like a supermarket, right? You'd visit there when you want something and patiently search through different options. Comprehensive printed guides were available at all offices and it had everything that you need to know. With age of digitization, these guides move to various technology platforms from office table to laptop screens. But to a large extent, the challenge remains same. You still had to go through various platforms, various sites to find information. That means the employees had to go to benefits Benefits did not come to them. Now, the year-round holistic benefit philosophy that we have been discussing is about benefits going to employee, not the employee searching and looking for benefits. And on a platform where they can find it easily. That's primarily their mobile screen. The delivery content, not just what they want, but also educate them on what they may actually need. It's a healthy habit building program. This was all the first made possible using super app principle, which started during uh, more like year 2000 onwards with embedded AI tools. What the tools used to do, they crawled through the library of benefits content and used to pull out data, which was relevant for people and then present it to them. But this made a big change between how the benefits were received earlier to now. Now as the fight for user attention intensified, the social media platforms making us habitual of receiving personalized content on a very regular basis. Benefit tax also evolved. Now new age benefit applications are now combining social media's profiling algorithms. They can understand your browsing habits. Now based on the quality of available data, which is a key, how much data can you really feed? What kind of algorithms can you really build? These platforms can even make suggestions to users on benefit plans that suit their life. Send them nudges that this is something which is available. Why have you not taken it? Are you looking for it? Providing them with the contact details so that they don't forget to complete these tasks. This is the evolution which we have seen in benefit technologies. Although yes, there are different organizations which are still at different stages of evolution. Some have adopted it, some have started their journey, but an overwhelming number of corporates employers are realizing that this is a journey which they should be taking. Now, this brings us to our third poll question. We saw benefits which have been created. We saw whether you were able to access it through your mobile phone out of the office network. Now, how many different applications you use? So we are going through the technology journey starting from the first stage, second stage of digitization, everything on a platform but how many platforms you end up accessing? And I'm, I'm not talking only about the benefits which we just saw, but apart from that, other employer sponsored benefits, including your payroll and reimbursements. Is it between one to two different logins that you can access everything or you have to make between two to four or more than five different times that you have to log in if you would want to access the entire universe of benefit ecosystem, or it may take more time. I'm happy to say that an overwhelming 45% say that between one to two logins and they can access all the information. Though there's still say 40 or rather more than 50% who have more than two to four logins or more than five different logins, a good 11%. For 5%, they still don't know. Truly it will take more time. 
and could be that there's a set of benefits which the organization so painstakingly created, but they could not access it because the access was not available in a format that they wanted to receive it. Now this brings us up, if we can move to the next slide. How is the future evolving between the gig economy, the work from home, using of AI? And this is interesting because India, as you know, has always remained the hub for innovation, even for AI. India is one of the early adopters of deploying AI and machine learning principles and benefit applications across various processes, may not be as deeply invested in benefits, but from recruitment to searches, a lot of other things. The concept has still room to grow though. Use of bio trackers, we all know, is a habit building apps, captive socials, captive benefit marketplaces on rise. But these things have been surveyed created in silos. A large number of employers are not only aiming at unifying now their scattered data and platforms using the concept of super apps for improving employee experience, but are also working on harnessing this data in real time. I cannot wait for a month or a year to understand how my employees felt about it. I want to do not right now because my benefits are not annual now. My benefits are of immediate consumption. So I need to know an immediate basis, how much impact are these making? So unification of application access and data, not only improving employees experience, but also helping these administrators in drawing more accurate, actionable insight from superior quality of data. Now, now this leads us to now hearing from our esteemed panelists, what has been their journey in terms of benefits, what kind of technology programs that they have made, offered to their employees, and what is their vision for future? Was, Maybe I could go first. And that's a really yes, good sir. question, Oliver. So as I think about what we want to be, I think it aligns to a lot uh, to our culture of caring, growing, and winning together. And a lot of the benefit interventions that we think about bringing to life are aligned to that pillar of care. And our vision really is to provide services to people who need it, when they need it, and the way they need it. Are we there yet? No, but it's a journey that we are embarked on. That's how I would maybe summarize. Thank you so much, Prasant. Uh, Sankal, what do you think is the future of benefits? Where are we leading? What is, what is your organization's philosophy when it comes to benefit programs? Sure, Valva. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I won't actually... Uh, go far different from what Vasant has actually mentioned. With regards to benefits, uh, ultimately the meaning lies in the word itself. It has to benefit the employee. It can't be a top-down uh, initiative. It can't be a person sitting in the silo inside a room designing something that will maybe impact uh, everyone. And that is where the whole point of uh, flexibility and fluidity comes into picture. With regards to benefits, uh, as an organization, uh, we are a caring organization. We put our employees first. Uh, we are one of those global organizations who ultimately try to drive things locally because we understand that you may drive salaries globally, you may drive incentives globally, but benefits have a very local angle to it because benefits is something that has a well entrenched system with the social structure that exists with the various life stages that people are at and their needs are not exactly to be fulfilled by the employer only because the social structure, the government structure, the financial structure may also have some part to play in it. And that is where we try to not only fill the gaps, which the government and the social structure are not able to provide, but we are also in a constant endeavor to upgrade and modify our benefits with the changing needs, whether that's a demographic change or it's an external influence like the recent COVID pandemic. That is the way we are envisaging and I believe that will be the future of it. Absolutely. Shiram. Hi everyone. 
uh, my audio. Yes, sure. absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, the way I think about this is, and I think uh, all the three of us here manage total rewards. Um, you know, benefits always struggles against its cousin compensation in the sense that, you know, it's, it's really what employees fee, you know, they, it's, it's the more meatier discussion on the table in organizations. But benefits um, we've seen in the last, especially in the last one year, has punched above its weight in the sense of it becoming like the front and center of conversations we've been having with stakeholders, especially in the pandemic era. And I think one of the things that benefits has done better, and it's, it's purely a personal opinion. I mean, we could dispute that. I think the benefits landscape has been more innovative than the compensation landscape. Uh, I, I sometimes joke with my team, we could take a you know, two-year-old report and age it by 12%, and we would not land far, far away from the medians that have moved on the compensation side. But, you know, all organizations have got very innovative with benefits. They're reacting to things in some instances. They are proactively putting things in place. It's like uh, Sankal mentioned, it's very clear that whether organizations uh, expected employees to or not, they have turned back to employers when governments have failed. Um, and, you know, we talk about attraction and retention, but I think the higher purpose that all, all organizations are trying to achieve with their workforce is a, is a sort of affiliation, a little more than just an employer-employee relationship. And benefits really adds to that whole aura of, um, you know, being an employer of choice. So when the whole benefits landscape is kind of, as I feel, more vibrant and innovative, I think... Uh, perhaps all the more reason for, you know, digital automation, smart technology to make that happen and follow it. Absolutely. And Shiram, if I may ask, post pandemic, did you do any major change in your benefit ecosystem to reach out to employees? Um, we've introduced benefits like every organization. I mean, I've, uh, reacting to many, sometimes being proactive, um, but the ecosystem was always supported by a set of principles which haven't really changed. It's just that some of them have been reaffirmed um, and we're, we're even more focused on, on getting those done. Thank you, Shiran. And I would, I would take this to Vasant. How important was the employee experience? You have some of the best uh, tech systems for benefits. How important was the overall employee experience in that, the user experience in technology platforms that you introduced? Well, that's, I would say a lot of our activities really anchor on the principle of employee experience. And as we think about our journey and maybe the comment I made earlier about being able to deliver the benefits that people need when they need and the way they need it. I think the aspect that anchors in the background of all of that really are the themes of, flexibility and personalization. Uh, flexibility is one side of the coin. The other side of the coin I'd say is also complexity because just the nature of choice makes plans more complex. And so in order to be able to deliver this in a manner that reflects our brand promise uh, and to deliver the right employee experience, we felt like we don't really have an alternative except to uh, rely on technological platforms and backbones to be able to deliver those solutions. So for us, employee experience has been key. I would say a large chunk of that journey has been achieved by uh, moving away from individual contracts uh, with service providers to engaging more broadly with aggregators who kind of bridge the marketplace between, let's say, healthcare providers and team members to more effectively providing them the sense of choice uh, especially given that in the post pandemic world, we had employees and team members working everywhere. And so how is it that we can really be equitable, equally accessible with our benefit programs for all of our team members was a challenge on our table. And the only way we were able to, I feel effectively address that was by banking on technology to really help bridge the gap and bring flexibility to our team members. So I would say, at least in my mind, technology, flexibility, employee experience, they're all holding hands and walking together. This just brings me to the other question. How do I measure employee experience when it comes to benefit tech? Well, uh, the way we do it, or maybe it's something I can talk about. Yes. We try and evaluate through a host of uh, team member pulse surveys on how they feel our health, 
well-being and you know financial assistance programs are panning out vis-a-vis uh, -vis the needs of our team members. Part of the questions we do ask are anchored around um, the user experience uh, through the applications, the ease of access. These are all aspects that we do check upon. And the ultimate metric that we measure ourselves is, does Target care about my overall well-being? I think that's the metric that it all kind of bubbles up to. And so I would say that technology, user experience, all of those are aspects that bubble up to that larger whole. And so we get that information mostly as feedback from our team member pulse surveys. Thank you so much. Uh, Sankal, we heard about creating different technology platforms, user experience, but with the whole work from home post COVID, there's so much of data which is now flowing from different houses, probably the unsecured Wi-Fi networks. There's so much of benefit data, employee data. What is your advice? What is what is your outlook in securing the people data? It's an interesting question. Uh, specifically with work from home, the assumption that I think almost every company went with uh, work from home prior to the COVID pandemic was a sense of, uh, let's say, a, a big balance between trust and mistrust. Do I trust my employees to do the right thing? Do I trust my systems to actually support? Do I trust the external network and uh, the routers or the local cyber cafes to do their job effectively? Do I trust my safety protocols to be in place? Uh, that is where uh, the challenge lay when we are forced to shift into work from home. How do you gear up the entirety of the systems? Yes, you can uh, put up flyers, make notices, put in policies, uh, put in a, a host of uh, checks and balances so that information is, uh, let's say, secure. Uh, we are a global organization and that is where the, the data requirements that actually went live with GDPR apply beyond the political borders of Europe also. And that is where it became important that how do you actually ensure that this data point remains secure and safe? Because now people are accessing through their homes. And frankly, yes, it was work from home, but people were roaming around the entirety of the country. People were taking up places in Goa and the hill stations just to get out of their homes, but still be working. And those kind of workations, as they were started to be called, actually asked for accessibility through more public networks because you are not in your home anymore you are sitting in a hotel lobby argument sake and you're trying to access it i mean that is where yes uh, the technology helped to a large extent i mean uh, microsoft is one of the biggest beneficiaries from this not only through teams but uh, less told about uh, the azure system uh, and the system protocol that they have for basically ensuring security of all the documents or information being passed upon. That is the kind of uh, technology checks and balances that came into picture. But the bigger thing that ultimately came about, and this is a learning, was the fact that if you give people enough power and freedom to do it, uh, your trust will be restored because they will do the right thing. And we saw that happen. We didn't see uh, any sort of challenges, any sort of data leaks, any sort of mismanagement or misappropriation of data happening, whether that was with regards to employee data or with regards to business or confidential reports also. So that is, uh, I think, uh, not exactly an answer to the question, but it's more of a direction which industries took to various degrees, uh, especially those who embraced this with open arms and are now saying that, okay, even if COVID goes back and everything is returned, we'll still continue to work from home because we trust our employees. We have learned over the last two years that our trust will be repaid. Thank you, Sankal. And I think, JB, you can really help here. What are some of the trends that you have seen around data security? What our clients or other companies across the globe have said 
what are the challenges which have come especially during the covid and post covid scenarios sure i don't think the, the change of covid didn't change the challenge uh, in terms of data security, but it certainly, to some kind of point, it highlighted the relevance in terms of where employees were located and based, and certainly the notion of having employees complete data uh, paper forms from um, from hill stations and so on is is not a great experience, but also not incredibly secure either. Um, I think the biggest chain challenge we see with with data Gorova is just that it's such a changing landscape all the time, right? The threats change on a regular basis from cyber. So companies, organizations are never up to date. But again, what, what you can do, I guess, is work with companies that have incredibly robust, robust architecture, work with leading brands and are able to respond and adapt to that. So we always wish that, that data security was one and done, but it's an ongoing challenge we, we need to confront within the industry. Um, but certainly there are best practices with, which we can use to do that. Thank you. Uh, Shiram. What is what is your view of using of AI and bots into employee benefits? To what extent you have seen uh, such deployment truly really at Qualcomm? Uh, did you say AI and bots? That's correct in employee benefit programs. Yeah, I, I you know we're on that horizon where we're exploring all opportunities for automation. It's got little to do org structure as well, um, but the identification of repeatable tasks, uh, tasks that can be made intuitive, we're on that journey. Uh, I have not experienced the AI bot journey yet, but I've been told that it's uh, inevitable as part of the fourth industrial revolution that we will all deal with chats and bots very soon. And I, I can totally see that. I've, I've actually seen that happening with other functions, other support functions uh, at Qualcomm, and I think HR is definitely uh, leaning towards that journey. Um, uh, I, 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 there's really nothing to say against that uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, we're not thinking of any dystopian uh, where, you know, the bots are telling employees what to do, but in the basic sense of efficiency, there's really nothing against that logic. And I think as an HR fraternity, I feel it pushes us all to uh, deliver up the value chain when those tasks are really taken away and uh, automated. So I think it's 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 sort of pressure, but it's a good pressure that I, yeah. Absolutely, uh, wasn't in terms of the benefit programs. Uh, one of the key aspects which I spoke about expectation in India was what can be a benefit which is touching more lives on a much regular basis, rather than one-time consumption benefits. Benefits like uh, healthcare, doctor on call, or medicine home delivery, or psychiatric consultation. What kind of benefit programs did you focus or your focus changed after the pandemic? Which new programs uh, you brought in? I'd say we did a combination of bringing new programs and reinventing ourselves on existing programs to cater to a population that was now geographically quite disparate, I would say. So some of the programs that I can think of top of mind is that we digitized our annual health checkup program through a kind of an online platform and a marketplace that connects uh, diagnostic centers and hospitals to our team members. We also launched a on-demand health risk assessment plan, which had over 40% of our team members participate at some point in time or the year or the other. And that gave us a lot of insight into what aspects of health and well-being do we want to create additional interventions on. We also brought in teleconsultation. I think that was uh, one program that was quite well received, especially as a lot of team members were quite concerned about risks associated with visiting the hospitals. We also brought in associated programs around chronic health management and overall health management really through a health coach program that team members could choose to be a part of and may even include their spouses should they so choose. These are just examples of some things that we've been able to bring to the table apart from, you know, Making some standard increases in insurance coverages to make sure that the pandemic related context is covered. These were some interventions I think we brought to the table with a fair degree of success. But I think what, 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 what's worked best for us is uh, how we've been able to kind of leverage our programs to enhance them along two key themes. And I find myself repeating myself, but the two key themes that we have really anchored on are personalization and digitalization. If there's a solution that touches these two boxes, 
we feel that utilization is going to be high, acceptance is going to be higher, and engagement is going to be higher. And the best part I feel personally about engagement being high is not just in the utilization numbers, it's that the workforce overall is more invested in the program. And so you have a constant stream of feedback that helps you think about what the next big thing for you could potentially be. So that's maybe how I'd sum it up in terms of interventions we've gone through. Absolutely. And Sankar, what is, what is your views? What are new benefits did you focus on post-pandemic, which you think would be long staying now? Uh, so let me try to uh, answer it in a slightly different manner. Uh, we are ultimately a traditional uh, manufacturing uh, and sales organization. Uh, we are an organization that has been there for quite a long time. We have a very large portion of our workforce that uh, will never see the work from home scenario go live because they're working on production lines that you can't take them home. So that's like 60% of our population. So for them, and precisely them, uh, nothing changed. Their work scenario remained. Uh, their uh, team scenario remained. Their uh, collaboration remained. What actually changed for them was the, uh, let's say, the level of risk and uh, the level of uncertainty with regards to coming to the workplace the supposed workplace, which was safe, so as to speak, suddenly was a question mark. And that is where the reaffirmation of safety at workplace became important. The other big portion of workforce being an FMCG actually lies in the field. And yes, during the lockdown, uh, we did transition to a telecaller model, but that's something which can continue the local Kirana stores will continue to have requirements and those requirements will need to be serviced. And we are in a hard uh, hand to mouth kind of a product scenario. It can't be just put over an, e put over an email as a software instead of a compact disk drive. And that is where that product still needs to reach that distributor. So the other piece of our workforce, which is the field force, also nothing changed for them with regards to the work environment, nothing changed for them with regards to the team environment. So actually for us, it became, uh, and actually taking it a bit ahead from what Vasan was saying, the personalization piece became important because for us, before going to the personalization, it became three different sets of employee groups who were now demanding three different types of benefits. And that is where we first had to focus on, okay, what is the need that they have? So the ones for whom the workplace continued to be the workplace, the safety at workplace became the new definition of benefit. And what exactly can be done uh, as an added on? Because the workplace is not shifting. There is no work from home kind of thing or an online kind of thing, which is going to entice them. Nothing has changed for them. So for them, the benefit bouquet became an entirely different concept. And that is where we had to come up with, uh, let's say, a reaffirmation and reinforcing of, we care for you, we care for your family, we care for your safety. These are the additional protocols and principles and guardrails and safety nets that are there for you at your workplace, for you transiting to your workplace. And even after you have left the workplace and reached home, basic affirmations like vaccinations, testings, uh, ensuring social distancing, ensuring sanitation, ensuring cleanliness, ensuring uh, any untoward incident is properly reported, recorded, and resolved in timely manner became the new course of normal. So that is where introduction of benefits actually took a backseat and it was doing the basics over and over again. Whereas for the other population, which actually transitioned to work from home, that is where the introduction of benefits became important. We had to do the basics of actually creating a workspace at their home and providing support to them to actually do that. While we had to then let go of some traditional benefits like providing gym memberships, on-site daycares, because frankly, nobody is coming on-site anymore. 
and you don't foresee that happening also so how do you transition that so that is where we said okay if on site daycare is not going to happen but people will continue to have children who will need to be continuously let's say looked after or engaged then what is the there on offer and that is where we improvised and made the programs inclusive of virtual daycares virtual nanny cares home cares as well and we partnered with various agencies that would provide these benefits on an online platform which is like an extension of the on site daycare and it's an either or scenario so that gives the personalization and choice kind of a system these were the type of areas we actually dwelt into i think that that's a tough challenge when you have such a diverse workforce how do you get both the technology and benefits which can reach out to all of them effectively uh, and if if i may ask shiram it's almost a sort of balancing act now you have benefits you also have to have right platform tools to take it to employees what percentage of overall hr budget actually goes towards the hr technologies today and what type of technologies really we should have which we are missing right now what is your take on that yeah like so like i said i mean for us um, our larger mission vision statement as we call it is underpinned by the need to be competitive but also have personalized packages and automated and in, in, intuitive smart solutions um and i think what often i've seen in organizations is that employers do focus on technologies that are essentially used to run systems that are important for the employer for example you will have an enterprise system that runs your performance management system that runs your rewards really well um, but then sometimes the same focus is not there in employee facing systems you know um, you know how do you you know collaborative tools career portals benefits administration systems to make it simpler um i don't think that it's because the intent is not there but i think the the first one, i mean it's it's kind of a linear journey i guess you need to have those basic ones in first just to run the organization efficiently and those are often in place like a work day or sap and all of that stuff which run efficient processes i think the same focus could be extended to employee facing um you know suite of tools um so you know that's that's the first thing i'd say for us personally uh we have 33 countries out of which 10 of the countries are on on very robust platforms but the 10 countries constitute about 75% of our population so 75% of our population are on smart systems um we uh, i i don't think cost is the conversation at all here i mean from a total benefit spend i would think that uh, wherever we've got these solutions in place that would account for less than 2% of our total benefit spend so i don't think and I, and i that's what i believe the roi is is pretty impactful um i think the challenge is when you really go out there are times when you want to run solutions like we discussed this benefits is pretty um you know localized uh to get one uniform suite of technology that can deliver across is sometimes challenging um and then to manage those differently in terms of accounting and all of that stuff becomes sometimes a challenge uh i don't personally looking at the ratio i don't think it's a cost conversation i think uh, it is more a need and in that where are you where you are in that journey of enterprise systems versus uh, employee facing systems thank you so much shriram uh wasn't really one final question to you sure a lot of these benefits which have been created various employee groups i also spoke about the growing trend of using mobile phone for everything every day obviously the pandemic has increased the utilization how important is it to take a lot of these benefits out of corporate systems and put it on the mobile device of an employee very um I, you know if we go back to the same statement i made earlier about delivering benefits that are relevant for team members in a way they want when they want and we focus on the way they want and we know the more recent generations are a more here and now approach and we can all agree that mobiles are definitely a more here and now hardware device than maybe a laptop or a desktop and so if you're really focused on those original tenants of how you want to deliver benefits i feel like it's 
almost an inevitable imperative that we will move some of these solutions and make them accessible over mobile. It's a journey we are on ourselves. Our enterprise systems are accessible over mobile. Our health and well-being platforms are accessible over mobile. And we plan to expand that to a broader plethora of benefits. But I think I, I, I really echo with something Sriram said earlier, right? Like, apart from having, apart from having a sense of how it's accessed, it's also going to be a lot about um, the, the cost imperative, like you said, is, is, is not the key piece because that is a component of the experience, right? And so as we look at the experience overall, the, co the, co the conversation moves away from cost to the value that you're able to deliver by providing here and now solutions. The important piece though, I would say, um, a lot of us, I dare say, are challenged with how do we continue to build team member awareness or employee awareness in a manner that people know what benefits are available and can access it as and when they need it. The biggest challenge in my mind, at least at this point in time, is the various different portals that people have to log into to access, uh, uh, you know, wide plethora of benefits. And most of them are accessing it only when they need. So to know what they want to find at a moment of need is still a huge challenge. And so I know there's been talk in the market about some form of super app. I think um, it's a solution that's begging to be solved. I think that's maybe where my mind goes in terms of what could be the next leap that team members look for and employees can deliver to them in terms of accessibility towards benefits. Absolutely, I, I completely agree with you. And one of the most important parts say services like EAP, in most of the cases it's not available on mobile devices. It's somewhere in the emails, it's somewhere in the HR systems, but say 12 o'clock, midnight, employee out of hospital, seriously seeking some help, where can he find this information quickly? It should be on the mobile phone, the only piece of technology people quickly carry with them. Let's, let's hear it uh, now from the members who have joined this webinar, what kind of questions, queries that they have towards our esteemed panelists. Let's hear from them. Hey, Gaurav, thanks so much. I think this has been a great, uh, you know, insightful discussion so far. Uh, we have some questions on the tab, so maybe we'll just quickly take them and post that we'll open the lines also. So we have Soumya Sreshth asking Sankal, uh, personalizing benefits sounds great, Sankal, but is this taken as a preferential treatment by other set of employees? So Sankal, we'd like to take a go at that. Okay. Uh, so, uh... Thanks for the question. Uh, so, Swamya, let me answer it in this manner. When I say personalization of benefits, so there are two pieces to it. So, the example that I took of the varied workforce that we have being a traditional manufacturing and sales organization, a lot of this personalization happens because of the nature of job and the nature of work environment in which the job exists, which for a large part, the uh, of and around 80-85% of population that we have is fixed in nature. The job and the work environment in which the job exists is not going to change. So the personalization for these is more linked with the job and the job nature. And whoever be the incumbent sitting and doing that job is actually going to see the same thing. The personalization there will happen basis the fact that what exactly is the life stage the person is at. Uh, I'll take a typical example. Uh, if I am providing additional insurance coverage for the employees who are out there in the field daily interacting with hundreds of different individuals traveling across cities and districts for this additional insurance they might decide that they wish to take this additional insurance in a manner that satisfies their life stage. If they are a single person staying alone, uh, whereas if they are a person with a spouse and a kid at home or with elderly parents that are at home, the way they will address and take this benefit will be decided by their life stage. And that's the personalization. The other piece and which is more uh, prevalent now specifically with COVID and work from home is the population that actually went to work from home and personalization for them 
meant a very different piece. Uh, I have a home wherein I already have an office set up. I don't need an office set up. So what do I do with that office set up support I'm given? I don't need it. Uh, maybe I can get it converted into a home gym support because I'm not going to go out to the gym given the whole scenario that we have in the external world. I have a home which has two rooms and that's like a reality in Mumbai where real estate is ridiculously costly. Then uh, two rooms, I already have three adults and two kids. There is no way I'm going to be able to do that. So why don't you make this allowance a piece I can use to go and work in a co-working space? And that is where you can figure it out for me. So that is the kind of personalization, or the difference in personalization. And uh, we haven't had that experience yet with regards mm -hmm. to employees feeling that, okay, it's kind of uh, lack of better words, discrimination. But then again, we are open to feedback and we do take that seriously. Thank you so much, Sankal. This sounded so much like the whole power of choice being given to employees and flex benefits, which we keep passionately talking about, uh, it is look, looking to be one of those uh, areas to go to for the benefit leaders in time to come. Yes, thank you so much for endorsing that. I think, uh, Sriram, we have this interesting question and I really heard of, you know how you spoke about the benefits versus cash uh, conversation. And yes, we do have this interesting question from Siddharth Edla. When the outside market is not in our control, what can companies do to stay on target and pay competitive remuneration to the employees? Sorry, Sriram, I think you are on mute. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's slightly weird out of our discussion framework, I guess. Uh, it it's, yeah. doesn't seem like a benefits conversation alone. Yes. Um, you know, firstly, what I do is I question whether we're all, all of us, and I think all of us need to do that, is whether each of us, what each of us is going through is really indeed, the, the resignation, all of that we, we're seeing yeah. is really indeed great. Um, I mean, or is it, you know, a peak from the pandemic? Uh, because it, it's, it's possible in some companies, uh, it, you know, it's not, there's nothing great about the great resignation. I mean, it, it's definitely a US phenomenon. But I think the first question I would ask, which I ask in my own company is, is it return to the pre-pandemic levels? It's definitely an increase in attrition, a more mobile talent market, and definitely heating up of the salaries. But is it the great resignation? And if the answer is great resignation, I have two different answers on benefits and compensation. On benefits, yes, probably the time to appear, you know, even more caring, not appear, to genuinely be an employer of, you know, providing some of these intangible benefits and spending on that. On compensation, I would say, you know, outspending is not a great strategy. It's not a sustainable strategy, especially for large organizations. Um, and not every attrition is catastrophic. Uh, not e any, not all growth is achieved by hiring of talent. It could be strategic by acquisition. So that really delves into another realm of what your strategy is. But outspending your peers on compensation could be catastrophic. Has to be more planned, more sustainable, and more strategic. Absolutely, Shiram. This is so well articulated. Thank you so much. I think next one I'll take a go at Basant. Uh, this question is for Basant. This is from Vitika Jena. Uh, Bitika's question is, uh, how did you manage to answer the benefit needs of varied age group and the way they wanted to avail it? As you mentioned, it's a journey. I would like to share some learnings there. Well, firstly, thank you for that question, Bitika. I, I think the answer is, well, simple to understand, but maybe slightly harder to execute. And the simple answer is, to understand the benefit needs of a varied age group, just ask them. So what we did, for example, is we ran an employee pulse survey to get a sense of what exactly people wanted and how they wanted it across a plethora of benefit programs that we offered and did not offer. We were able to slice the responses by various demographics, levels, gender, et cetera, to really understand if there were any leading causes for certain groups to prefer certain benefits. We followed that up by organizing focus group discussions where the same kind of demographic slices were enabled so that we kind of get a holistic view in each of those groups from various demographic points of view. And I think it's a combination of that in partnership with um, external consultants who do bring their own expertise to the table to understand which of these aspects lends to the right thinking when we think about plan design and which of these aspects have had success stories in the past. And we simply marry the success stories with what we are hearing from our team members and launch the plan. 
And then based on feedback, we continue to build off that plan to ensure that in the spirit of true inclusivity, that we continue to cover the fringe ends of uh, our employee needs. I suppose at a high level, that's how we approached it. Thanks so much, Basan. This, this really was an interesting insight into how you achieved that. Uh, we have this question for Sankalp, and this is about uh, virtual daycare in view of press facility that you spoke about. Uh, Lakshmi Machani would like you to elaborate a bit about this. Sure. Uh, so thanks, Lakshmi, for the question. This is something uh, that we released, uh, let's say, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic itself. Uh, now, of course, the need for providing a daycare became more, uh, let's say, uh, accepted uh, once the change in the law happened. And that was done uh, with a very specific reason, uh, with individual states coming up with their own definitions of what will be the age bracket and what will be the years to which you will need to provide the services. And then there were a lot of daycares that actually came up with providing solutions, so whether inside your corporate offices or nearby your corporate offices. Having said that, once COVID actually hit, the whole idea of a daycare uh, became a far-fetched reality. No parent would actually send their infant or toddler to a daycare when they themselves are not comfortable enough in going to an office space. And that is where the virtual daycare or a virtual setup came into picture because the need for it was realized that there is demand for still managing and engaging and engrossing the kids in a manner which will be better for their development. Yes, they cannot do the physical meters, but they can still learn. And that is where the virtual daycare setups actually came into picture. Uh, there were, uh, let's say all of the standard names uh, like ProEves and a few others, they came up with a lot of programs and platforms on these. And that is where we as an organization accepted the fact that yes, daycare is a benefit which is ultimately used by an individual on their personal choice. And if they still need to do it, then a daycare and a virtual daycare are ultimately the same thing. It's like work from office and work from home. So that is where we extended the benefit and we said to people that we understand that the need still exists. And if the need exists and you wish to execute the need by taking it virtual, then please go ahead and do so. You may choose to do it from one of these who we have identified as partners, or you may choose to identify your own and still take up that benefit. But rest be assured, we are not withdrawing a benefit just because things mm -hmm. have closed down. So that's how we did it. Thank you so much, Sankal. This was very innovative. Not too often we hear this. Uh, very useful out there. Uh, we have one raised hand, uh, that Zakaria Adomako. Uh, Zakaria, uh, we'll just unmute you right there. Nilarji, will you unmute Zakaria and allow him to talk? Yeah, Zakaria, I think you wanted to ask a question to one of the panelists. Would you like to ask live? Sorry, I think we don't have him here probably, or maybe it was by mistake. Yeah, we have a question from Subramaniam Yadati. Uh, this question is for Basant. So Basant, what are the strategies followed to increase awareness and utilization of available benefits in the organization? I guess we're still figuring out, to be honest. Um, this is an ongoing journey for us. And so, so, some of the things that we feel work at this point in time is the manner in which uh, communication is consumed by team members, especially as it relates to team member benefits. We feel like policies, guidelines, FAQs, I mean, that's great documentation to have, but it's not really something people take the time to go through necessarily. So one of the approaches that we might see ourselves considering in the future is, can we move away from, let's say, a more policy guideline FAQ approach to a more kind of a brochure or ad-based approach. I think about the point that I think Jamie was speaking about, or I might be mistaken, maybe it was Gaurav, but we spoke about like delivering the consumer grade experience. And as we think about that, policies are not consumer grade experience. They are long, tiresome, and very boring, quite frankly. And so how is it that you can pivot on that to create material that presents benefits as an advertised offering, calling out the salient features and ease of accessibility through easy to get in touch contact points, would that be a better way to deliver that 
rather than to policies and guidelines. That's one. The second one that I'd call out is the timing of the communication. A lot of people are speaking about digital overload, communication overload. So there is only so much mind space that we have to operate with our team members. And so we have to have some method to pick the right point to bring out the right communications if the intent is to drive awareness and utilization. So one thing we try and do is through our metrics and reporting uh, agenda that we have, we identify certain points where utilization is not at the expected level as compared to previous years or at the expected level as a result of the change in the program. And then we choose to invest on those red spots to say, here are moments where we could communicate to drive better outcomes. We're not fully there in the journey, but these are two things that I imagine we would be considering quite strongly. Thank you so much, Basan. That's useful. Uh, we'll take this last question for the day. We just one minute left there to close the session. Uh, this was for Sridam from Namit. Uh, this is more about uh, when we move towards a consumer grade delivery of benefits, which Gaurav and even Jamie spoke passionately about, uh, then analytics does become very vital. So from your overall experience uh, in Qualcomm, otherwise also in your journey, uh, what kind of things, uh, Sridam, do you see analytics driving the consumer grade experience and more? Um, so I, I think uh, the first place where analytics comes in is just to understand consumer behavior uh, in the in the sense of providing a consumer grade experience, right? I mean, what do your users want? Um, you could get that intelligence if you have uh, a plethora of offerings, like for a company like us in India, which runs more than 35 options in an insured program and more than 15 non-insured options. It, this is this itself is a large canvas for data mining. Um, when we hear, and sometimes it's it, it gets you into awkward situ situations where leaders be telling you, this is what employees want. And we're like, no, this is what employees want because here's the data, right? And and you know, there are there are there are these interesting conversations where I still remember when we were trying to launch a personalized choice uh, in, in our benefits. Across the leadership, I heard it's too complex. They're not going to get it. It's going to confuse them. And today we are at a juncture where they're pushing us for more options. The employee base is pushing us for more options. How we understand that, how we validate that requirement, whether we really feel there is a need, there is a sizable mass that will opt for those things. I think the backbone of all of that is analytics. Then there is the spend. And you know, it is important in certain countries and it is not so heavy in other countries. So where it is important, I think analytics plays a big role there as well. And I guess with what you were talking about, finally, as the advent of the fourth revolution where bots and AI and all of that come, that's going to add another layer of data that we you know, can mine into. I think at the end of all of this it is that fine line you draw between PII and PHI data and how to use that. Very true, very true, Sridam. Thanks so much. Uh, with this, I'll close today's session. Thank you so much, Basant, Sriram, Sankal for joining us today. And I thank all the audience out there. We had more than 200 people who participated today. And thanks so much to all the company band leaders and it's our folks out there who participated in the Friday afternoon session with us. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks so much for the presentation on Azov Agility Report. And that was very helpful. And Gaurav, thank you so much for entering the session. On behalf of Masamas Benefits India, I'll thank all of you and the audience there for spending time with us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a happy weekend. Bye.